I want to do just a quick review of where we're at um, with our study. In Revelation, the last three weeks we've been going through God's evaluation of the churches. Three weeks ago, we had the first two churches. Then we had three more the next week. And last week, we saw the last two. And varying degrees of issues with the churches, but an honest evaluation of where they're at to help them improve. So, with that, I I just want to start out and, and pray for the lesson tonight, and then we'll get into it. Father God, I just thank you for this study of Revelation. I thank you for how you see us and how you choose us to be yours and to be your people. And the things you change us into, Lord, help us to see that. Help us to see what your spirit does in our heart. And Lord, most of all, help us to feel your presence and love you even more because of it. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So tonight's aim is faith in the deliverer unifies, unites God's people with, in Jesus Christ. Faith in the deliverer unites God's people in Jesus Christ. And our doctrine is on election tonight. And before we get too into it, I want to talk a little bit about election. But just to make sure everybody's clear... It's not our election down here that we're talking about tonight. It's God's election. So it's a little bit different. So I just want to make sure that's clear. God calls all of us to be saved. He calls everyone. God never compromises his justice, mercy, or righteousness. He never compromises. God holds all people responsible for their sin and response to Christ. So if he calls you and you reject his call, it's on you. It's your responsibility to stand up for the sins in your life. Because you've rejected his grace. And When you guys read the notes, pay attention to to page 6. There's a good uh, description of of the election and how BSF kind of describes how it works so we can understand it a little bit better. So, in your daily life, you make choices, don't you? We all make choices. When we make choices... We base them on outward appearance. What we see, what it looks like, what we expect. For example, if, if we go out and buy fruit at the market, we're going to pick the fruit that looks the best. And when we go driving, we're going to look up the directions that are the shortest to our destination. If you're buying a car, you're going to buy the nicest car for the price. And then if you're planning your day, you're going to plan out what works best for you because you need to squeeze everything in. And then if you're buying a puppy, you might walk past that window of adoption puppies because they're not as pretty as the purebred you might want or something like that. But I'm here to tell you that thankfully, God does it differently. Because who thinks they would have got selected if they were looking for the best looking guy around? Don't all raise your hands because it's not true. (laughs) I don't think I would have been that guy. And I don't think I can have the ability to do what he really wants me to do without him. So he chooses broken people and equips them. 
He doesn't look for the people that already have the gifts. He looks for the people that are willing to receive the gifts from him and molds them the way he needs you. All right, tonight we're going to talk about some prominent themes. So Keith mentioned this in one of the earlier lessons that we're going to study in the book of Revelations and then we're going to talk about a couple of themes every now and then just to introduce into the, the lesson so we can better understand Revelation as a whole. So tonight's one of those theme lessons and tonight our theme is God's plan for his people. God's plan for his people. And next week, Mark is going to be teaching about God's kingdom. So we're going to have two weeks of themes to kind of help get us situated for getting back into Revelation. So just to let you guys know what we're talking about. So these are overreaching themes that we study throughout Scripture. So it's not just Revelation that these themes are pointing to. We're going to look through the whole Scriptures. So, with that, our divisions tonight. First division is going to be unity in identity. And the second division, unity in diversity. Unity in diversity. So let's get started with the first division. Open our Bibles up to Acts 2. The Bible teaches us that God's people are his treasure. So we're going to kind of go on a little jet ride here. We're going to go back to the beginning and just kind of talk through God's people. So in the beginning there was a creation. God created Adam and Eve and the whole world. Then we had the fall. So in the fall, when the fall happened, in Genesis 3.15, God said, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. So in the beginning, he came up with a plan for us right away. Because he knew what was going to happen. And that plan is Jesus Christ. And we'll walk through the steps as we get to that. <clears throat> so it points to the Messiah. The people of God, the inhabitants of the earth, to use the terms we see in Revelation, those who resist God and his purposes. So that's there's going to be two sides, those who are for God and those who are against God. And we see that with Cain, the firstborn. He killed Abel. Abel was faithful to God and Cain was jealous. And then we move on and God chose Abraham and his descendants to be his people. And from there, his grandson Jacob had 12 kids. And they became the 12 tribes of Israel. God's chosen people. Then King David comes along. And God makes promises to David that his line is going to live forever. Which leads us to the eternal King Jesus. So that's the story of his people. God's inclusive offer of salvation to all peoples is becoming clearer and clearer as a Bible story unfolds. We see the Messiah here. Then in Acts, we open up in, in Acts 2. I'm going to read verses 1 through 4. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. 
And suddenly a sound like blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be the tongue, the tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. I've heard some people say that's where the baldness started, but I'm not sure if that's true. That's probably a vicious rumor. And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. <clears throat> so, before that, Jesus ascended to heaven because he had to go away before he could give them the Spirit. And that's what he promised he would do. He would send the Spirit. So wait, the Spirit is coming. Then we see on Pentecost, the Spirit did come. And then in Acts 2, 36 through 42, it says, Therefore, let Israel be assured of this, God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. This is Peter talking. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter's reply, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for forgiveness of sins. You will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children, for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. The promise is for everyone. Everyone that accepts it. With many other words, he warned them and pleaded with them to save themselves from the corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number. That's the day the church began. The church as we know it today. So, it all started with the Holy Spirit and the message they gave to cut to their hearts. So, let's look at our church today as we gaze into the book of Revelation. We're gazing into the book of Revelation, right? That's what we're doing this year. But, we're trying to see what he's trying to tell us with the book. And understanding his people and his call helps us understand what he's communicating in the book. So that's why we take these time outs for themes and talk about these themes. Acts tells us how persecution propelled God's people beyond the boundaries of Israel into the Gentile world. So now the Gentiles are being called in. Another one of God's promises. God preserved a faithful remnant within the nation of Israel. There's always a remnant in every church. We have some Jewish people that are Messianic Jews and believe Jesus is their Savior. But not a high percentage of them yet. Because the Gentiles are going to cause the rest to believe. When God calls all the Gentiles that are coming, then they will be jealous and come back to God. And they'll understand who Jesus Christ really was. Romans eleven twenty five and 26. I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers and sisters, so that you may be conceited. Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the full number of Gentiles has come in, and in this way, all Israel will be saved. 
So he's going to use us to save Israel. Interesting, isn't it? The people they wouldn't even eat with. Isn't that funny how the Spirit can unify people and bring them together? Maybe funny is not a good word. It's amazing. Absolutely amazing that he can do that. Revelation 5 confirms that people from every tribe, tongue, language, and nation will worship before God's throne. So this world isn't going to end until everybody hears. Because there's going to be people from all walks of life there that accept him. Matthew 24 says, And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. So we know that Israel is the key to the Gentile salvation, and now the Gentiles become a key to the Jewish salvation. God is building a kingdom of people that he chooses across time from around the world. And everyone who becomes one of God's people does so because God is gracious to sinners, Jewish sinners and Gentile sinners. God's grace is the only way we're saved. So let's look at Romans 11, 28, and 29. As far as the gospel is concerned, they are enemies for your sake. But as far as election is concerned, they are loved on account of the patriarchs. For God's gift and his call is irrevocable. Revelation shows us that we will carry his people faithfully to their eternal home and keep he, he will keep all of his promises. So as we move along, I just want to remind you some characteristics of God. He is omniscient, which means he knows everything perfectly. He is sovereign. He answers to no one. He set everything in motion and accomplishes his sovereign plan by his unlimited power. He does it with his unlimited power. And he is compassionate and gracious. He gives us what we do not deserve. What we do not deserve. Because none of us deserve to be saved. So that's just a little flyover of the history of God's people. Our first takeaway we want to consider God's plan for his people is this. God's love is outrageous, is so outrageous that he adopts broken people. That's our first principle. God's love is so outrageous that he adopts broken people. Because he knows he can change us. He knows our hearts. So, let's look at our second division, unity and diversity. Open your books to Ephesians 4. Books. Your Bibles? <laughs> We learn a little more about God's plan for his people. First, we will look at unity in mission from Ephesus 4 1 to 4 6. Unity in maturity 4 22 to 32. Those are the things I want to look at tonight. Jesus' letters to the churches revealed their organic unity as they faced very diverse situations and challenges. Jesus called them to steadfast commitment. He needed them to be committed for this to work. 
Some were tolerating sin and false doctrine. We learn about that with the churches, right? Others were suffering. Sardis needed a wake-up call. Laodicea just plain needed to get up. But God loves these people, and he wanted to be truthful with them so they could respond. They could see their ways weren't right. So here's the first way, worthy of our calling. It talks about being worthy of our calling. That's interesting, isn't it? He urges us to walk worthy of our calling, but there's no way we can do that <laughs> without him. So how does that work? We are not worthy of our calling. I can remember when Kevin called me and asked me to do this, and I'm just thinking to myself, why, why does he want me to do this? I, I don't think I can do this. And then I asked him, and he said, well, God put your name on my heart. And then it was like I, I was teaching in the children's program, and I thought, oh, I don't, I, I'm pretty good with the kids. I like working with the kids. And then it was kind of like God worked on my heart. He said, I need you to do this. But I didn't, I didn't feel confident that I could do it. And I feel a lot better now after I've done it a little bit. And he's kind of showed me that he can take care of me. But I needed that confidence from him to say yes to that call. It's just like anything else you get called into. You're not going to be the best before you start. And you've got to know that because God's going to equip you. When he's calling you to something, he will take care of you. So we're not worthy of his choice, yet we are, are to live worthy of our calling. So what is our calling? What does that mean? So we need to be completely humble and gentle. We need to be patient, bearing with one another in love. Keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. And in case you haven't noticed, these are the first six verses, so we're kind of going through them. <laughs> to one hope when you are called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all, and through all, and in all. That's Ephesians 2 through 6. 4, 2 through 6. So that's what he's calling us to do. How many of you guys were that like that when you were 20? I don't think I was. I was a lot more aggressive than I am today. And he's changed me through over, over the years. And it's... It's really been a blessing for me because I can see that now. And I'm, I'm more understanding of people and more accepting and definitely more unified with everybody around me. So the gospel not only saves us but propels us forward as his people. Christ does in us what we cannot do on our own. We can't do it ourselves have to remember that. It's not the human effort, but the mysterious and wonderful work of God himself that changes us over time. He calls us. Let's look at the unity maturity in God's people in 22 through 32. We'll start by reading 22 through 24. You were taught with regard to your former way of life, to put off old self, which is being corrupted by the deceitful desires to be made new <clears throat> in the attitude of your minds and to put on a new self 
created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. You need an entirely new way of thinking. And I don't know how many of you guys have experienced that, but I sure have over the years. And I'm really thankful for that. It's made me who I am today. Together we love the people around us and we love the power of the gospel. And this new self brings on something else new, a new way of relating to others. Can you have unity if you can't communicate? You can't get along? There's no way. So you need to be able to relate with the people around you. Verse 25 tells us we stop telling and believing lies and speak the truth, recognizing our unity. Lying doesn't pay. It doesn't help anything. It makes things worse. 26 and 27, we deal with our anger against others in a right way. Keep your composure. Don't blow off the handle. Those are things that I used to do. And with his help, I, I'm so much better now. In verse 28, we refuse to, refuse to steal what belongs to others. So think of others first. We grow up and we build up. And that's what our calling is. We build each other up. That's what sets God's people apart from the world and what sets the impact of the world. So God's people. Now we're going to talk about God's people and his expectations. God's people have a shared identity. God's people have a God-given loyalty to one another. I skipped one. (laughs) They are sinners saved by God's grace, filled with his hope, and transformed by his spirit. We need each other. We hold each other accountable. We spur one another on in faithfulness to God and his word. We join together to share the gospel and with the people around us. We grow together in Christian community to live as God's people in a world that needs the truth. This world needs the truth. And it needs it bad. There's some people that don't want to hear it. So we need to understand how we can communicate that message. God's diverse people are unified in identity and loyalty. God's people also understand their true destiny and relation. Revelation helps us grasp this. So Revelation is going to help make things a little bit clearer for you guys as we move along. One day, the people of God will gather together around his throne. And we need to look forward to that day. We need to keep that hope in mind as we struggle through things. He saved us in his mercy And he will return for us in his glory. And that leads us to our principle. God's victory is so certain that he unites and mobilizes broken people. Again, God's victory is so certain that he unites and mobilizes broken people. He's not worried about people not being able to do what he wants them to do because with their hearts and the Holy Spirit, they will do what needs to be done to mobilize and unify. His choice is shocking and his plan is ludicrous by human standards. Again, 
Without the Holy Spirit, we can't understand it. God picks people as His own who are unworthy of His favor, but will be eternally grateful for it. By God's power alone, God's people, His treasure, do His work on earth while they await His return. May we praise His name forever. What a heritage. What a God we serve. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for this message. I thank you for choosing us. And Lord, I just ask that you help us to see you in a new way and help us to serve you wholeheartedly and not hold back, Lord. Unify us together and help us to love each other with your spirit in our hearts. As we close, I want to leave you with one thing. I went back, just to hope that doesn't mess things up. But I want to remind you that Jesus calms the storm. He chooses broken to be his church. He chooses the broken people to be his church. What is he calling you to do? So if you feel he's calling you, talk to your group leader and see what his thoughts are, how he feels about it. And just show your interest, look, what God's calling you. If he's calling you, we want you to be involved. So just talk to your leader. Have a great week, you guys, and uh, we'll look forward to another theme week next week. Praise God from